This video will cover hypothesis testing, which is also called significance testing, and occurs when we test a claim about a population parameter using sample evidence that confirms or rejects the claim. There are four steps in the hypothesis testing process, all of which will be covered in this video. Here's a summary of the four steps in hypothesis testing. After this, we'll discuss each step in detail. The first step is stating the null and alternative hypotheses. We have to establish what we are testing to be true. Once we do that, we have to decide how close to true our sample statistic has to be for us to accept the truth. For example, we might want our estimate to be accurate with a 5% margin of error. This is called locating the critical region. Once we know that, we have to compute the test statistic, the z-value, or the t-value. Finally, based on our results, we draw conclusions from the study. The first step in the procedure is to convert the research question into a statement of the hypotheses null and alternative forms. Our study will be to collect and seek evidence against the null hypothesis as a way of deductively bolstering the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis, abbreviated H0, is a statement of no difference. In other words, the null hypothesis argues that there is no significant difference between our specified populations and that any observed difference is due to sampling or experimental error. The alternative hypothesis, or HA, is the opposite of the null hypothesis. It provides a statement of difference. In our study, we will seek evidence against the claim of H0 as a way of proving HA. Here's an example of setting up the null and alternative hypotheses. In the late 1970s, the weight of U.S. men between 20 and 29 years of age had a log normal distribution with a mean of 170 pounds and a standard deviation of 40 pounds. To illustrate the hypothesis testing procedure, we ask if body weight in this group has changed since 1970. This is called our research question, and it can be answered in one of two ways. Under the null hypothesis, there is no difference in the mean body weight between then and now, in which case mu would still equal 170 pounds. Under the alternative hypothesis, we assert that the mean weight has changed. Mu is not equal to 170 pounds. This is called a two-sided test, the most common form of hypothesis testing. We can also do a one-sided test in which we ask if weight has increased over time, so the alternative hypothesis would be mu is greater than 170 pounds. In step two, we will locate the critical region. Once we've established the research question, we have to define the level of accuracy with which we want to measure our test statistic. Any estimate from a sample will not be exactly the same as the population parameter, so we have to decide what we think is likely versus unlikely. This is called locating the critical region. The critical region consists of outcomes that are very unlikely to occur if the null hypothesis is true, or in other words, the sample means that are almost impossible to obtain. When we're estimating population parameters using a sample, we have to determine the cutoff values. These cutoff values are called alpha. If we decide that we want to measure the mean with a 90% precision level, then the shaded area on the left and right will be larger. If we want to measure with a 1% precision, then the area will be smaller and the range will be larger. These are the locations of the critical region boundaries for three different levels of significance. Alpha equals 0.05 alpha equals 0.01, and alpha equals 0.001. Note that boundaries get wider as the critical value falls. In most cases, researchers choose an alpha of 0.05 or 0.01. Our rejection region should have a probability of alpha if the null hypothesis is true, but some bigger probability if the alternative hypothesis is true. So if the mean lies inside the cutoff value for alpha, then the null hypothesis is true. Otherwise, we fail to accept the null hypothesis. The result is significant beyond the alpha level. For example, if alpha is 0.05, our result is significant if it's less than 0.05. Once we decide whether we want to measure accuracy at the 10%, 5%, or 1% level, we can compute the test statistic. Here we will use the z-score, which is a ratio comparing the obtained difference between the sample mean and the hypothesized population mean. This is an example of a one-sample test of a mean when the standard deviation sigma is known. In our male weights example, we're going to use the z-statistic because we know the population mean and the population standard deviation. To compute the z-statistic, we simply insert values derived from our sample into the formula. If in one sample we found that the sample mean was 173, then the z-statistic would be 0 0.60. Think of this value on the x-axis under a standard normal curve. Let's say we found the sample mean to be 185. Putting these values into the z-stat formula, we find the z-stat is 3.0. This is much higher at the tail end of the x-axis on a normal distribution. 
The final step is drawing conclusions. Once we've computed the z-value of our test statistic, we have to look at the corresponding probability values to find out if it's reasonably close to the population mean. A large value shows that the obtained mean difference is large and in the critical region. The difference is significant, which means we have to reject the null hypothesis that the weights have not changed over time. If the mean difference is relatively small, then the test statistic will have a low value. In this case, we conclude that the evidence from the sample is not sufficient, and the decision is to fail to reject the null hypothesis. The p-value is the area under the normal curve in the tails beyond the z-stat. It answers the question, what is the probability of the observed test statistic, or one more extreme when h0 is true? To convert z-statistics to p-value, we will use software. In one sample with a sample mean of 173, the z-statistic was 0.60. If we had this sample, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis that the mean weights have increased over time. Likewise, if we computed the p-values for z equals 3.0, we would get 0.001, which means we have to reject the null hypothesis that the mean weight has remained the same over time. Note that when we're looking at weight change instead of weight increase, all we have to do is multiply the one-sided p-value by 2 to do a two-tailed test. Since we will be using p-values in all our subsequent analysis, it's worth emphasizing what that means. p-values ask the question, what is the probability of the observed test statistic when h0 is true? Remember, the smaller the p-value, the more likely that your null hypothesis is not true. This graphic depicts the significance of p-values at less than 1%, between 1 and 5%, between 5 and 10%, and greater than 10%. These are common significance levels. 5% is the most common cutoff. However, note that it's unwise to draw firm borders for significance. As an example, a p-value of 0.27 would not be significant against h0. A p-value of 0.01, on the other hand, would be highly significant against h0. This concludes our video on hypothesis testing, also called significance testing, which occurs when we test a claim about a population parameter using evidence that confirms or rejects that claim. Today we covered the four steps in hypothesis testing. State the null and alternative hypotheses, locate the critical region, compute the test statistic, and draw conclusions. Mm -hmm.